Welcome into the Inside Bassmaster podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, episode 128. I'm your host today, Ronnie Moore, my co-host as usual, Kyle Jesse, joining me. And Kyle, today we have our Winning Ways episode, part two, and that would be the third and fourth stops of the Bassmaster Elite Series season. Our South Carolina swing, we were at Lake Murray in Columbia, South Carolina, and then we went over to Santee Cooper Lakes, Clarendon County, South Carolina, and we had two different yet very dramatic and fun events uh, to cover from a historical standpoint and from just a pure pleasure to watch go down on, on the water and in Bassmaster Live. So Kyle, I'm excited to have Drew Benton and Luke Palmer join us to break down how they got Elite Series titles this season. Yeah, absolutely. Middle to end of April in South Carolina obviously showed out the fishing was really good uh, at both places. Um, it was interesting to see, you know, Santee Cooper was a little bit different than last year when we went there. And we obviously addressed that before the, the uh, event happened. Uh, and then, you know, obviously like Murray being, uh, you know, a mixture of spawn, post-spawn, herring spawn. It was it was basically everything was on the table. So I'm an anxious to hear from uh, Drew Benton. And obviously the way he won it was going a little bit against the grain, you know, compared to the majority of the field. So uh, interested to hear from him and hear his take and. Obviously, like you said, talk to our two South Carolina champions. One thing that was cool about Lake Murray, just reflecting back on that, we've had a few uh, events since then. I, I think like 97 bass events in April and May so far. We've had <laughs> all different levels. But looking back at Lake Murray, is a place we hadn't been in so long. I think 2011 was the last time we were there. And then prior, it was 2008. Really not a bunch of experience for the people in the field other than maybe just because they've fished regionally there or certain times of the year, but there was a couple things going on. You had sight fish, obviously. You had a little bit of a shad spawn going on, but for some of our guys, and then you obviously had the blueback herring spawn kind of off the points, not deep, but just off the bank, You not necessarily way back in a pocket. And so we had all those things going for us. You had fish pre-spawn, fish post-spawn, all over the board, and it provided some dramatics. It, it might have only taken 87 pounds, almost 90 pounds. It feels weird saying that. As good as the event was weight-wise and big fish and stuff, it only took 87 pounds to win. So 22 a day basically got it done. But when, normally, Kyle, when we get down to the end of the tournament, there's some guys who their patterns die out on them, and they get way behind the eight ball. To think that our top 10 was still separated at the end of four days by less than 10 pounds, it was like eight pounds, six ounces. That goes to show you how they caught them throughout the entire top 10 all four days. There was really no lax day for anyone other than our champion who made up for it in a big way on the final day. Yeah, no, there was a, I mean, if you looked at the results, I mean, I know we have talked about this already before we, um, you know, shooting this podcast, but you know, Drew Benton's day three was so unusual, um, you know, compared to the rest of the top 10, because nobody else in the top 10 really had a really bad day, you know, like a day where um, you were significantly off of the pace. I mean, you could look at the four day weights on Bassmaster.com there at the end of the tournament. And he, his one day on day three was the anomaly of the entire top 10. And still obviously was able to come back and finish it off on the final day. So um, like you said, top to bottom, as far as consistency goes, I mean, most of those guys were reeling in, you know, high teens, low 20 pound bags every day, which was, which was just insane. I mean, I think the, we all kind of expected that to happen just based on what uh, Murray has been doing, but uh, I think it was even better probably than we could have, uh, could have guessed really. Yeah. If you look at our top 10, it went Benton, Shryock, Fujita, Walters, Cox, Cobb, Cook, Schultz, Williamson, and Kimura. Day one, Kenta Kamir had 15-3. Other than that, there was a 16-pound day for Bernie Schultz, a 15-13 day for Drew Cook, um, and then a 14-even day for Drew Benton. Those were the only ones that were substantially less than 20 pounds. There were some 18s and 19s in there, but only thing less than 16 pounds. There was only four individual bags like that throughout our top 10. And so I'm excited to talk to Drew Benton because I get to give him perspective of what we thought about his hopes of going into the final day based on day three, all kinds of things as well. He probably has also some intel from Drew Cook, his roommate, and Drew had his low day on day two before having an explosion. So uh, we'll see his mindset on that. But why don't we go ahead and get our winner from the Lake Murray Bassmaster Elite Series event, Drew Benton, getting his second title of his Elite Series career in the state of South Carolina and now uh, 
a two-time winner on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Kyle, our guest today, like we mentioned, Drew Benton, Bassmaster Elite Series champion two-time now. And you just mentioned to me uh, before we came on live that he is now inching up near the million-dollar mark for BASS winnings in his short career so far. Yeah, just just shy of uh, 932000 uh, a couple, few more good events this year, uh, really good ones. And, uh, we can circlip that or it'd be early next year. We'll see, but, uh, Drew, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Seems like it's a, uh, eternity since your win, but I guess it really wasn't that long ago. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've kind of rolled right along these last three events, um, throughout the season. It seemed like we only had two under our belt and then the classic and, and now we're past halfway point. So, um, uh, um, we're moving right along. We got one more event here in the south, and then we go north, and uh, it'll be it'll be over before you know it. So, Drew, we looking at the schedule. I mean, you got your first ever pro win of any of any trail over at the FLW Tour at Lake Okeechobee, and then we have Lake Seminole on the schedule, and that's your home lake, a place that you have a lot of experience on. Did you, in any situation or scenario, think that Lake Murray was going to be where you got an elite win this year? If you looked at the schedule of all the lakes, where did you have that ranked out of nine? Maybe like sixth, seventh of where you'd be able to get a title? Well, I really didn't know anything about Lake Murray. It was the first time I'd ever been on the lake. Um, a lot like Lake Travis. No one would have ever picked me to win Lake Travis. You know, my first Elite Series victory, a clear deep uh, body of water in Texas. Um, and that's the, the thing about fishing. You never know when those wins are going to come. Um, you just got to kind of keep your head down and keep plugging away and keep doing your job the best of your ability. And they just, they just happen. And um, that's, that's, you know, Lake Murray was no exception to that. Um, I would have never saw it coming if, you know, looking at the schedule um, and that's just the way fishing is. That's what's so fun and exciting about it. Drew, one thing I was I was interested to ask you was it seems like anytime there's a tournament naturally where bed fishing is going to be a deal. There's about three guys on the list that always are at the top of everybody's mind, and you're obviously there. These tournaments like Lake Murray, where everybody is kind of, you know, trying to overlook those fish, if that makes sense. Like they're trying to catch the herring spawners, the fish that are further along. Do you enjoy that, knowing that you're going to have a lot of those fish to yourself, or do you prefer a tournament where there's just a ton of them on the bank and you got to fight everybody else off for them. Like, what is your preference on that? Cause it seems like these tournaments later in the spring, you and cook and Cox always seem, seem to do really well because you're the remaining guys that stay up there and look for, you know, betting fish. No, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. You got to have options. I think that, uh, you know, with a few different things working, it spread guys out and, you know, that Heron deal, the, the shad spawn deal there was uh fish on bluegill beds and you know bass spawning and anytime you get an elite field all doing one thing it's hard to win doing that one thing i think you'll see that um whether it's a ledge tournament a shallow bite whatever the case may be you get all of us keyed in on the same thing and we're splitting fish up it's very hard to to win you'll oftentimes see a guy doing something crazy off by himself win the event um kind of off the wall and, and that's just the way it is. Um, so absolutely, I love um, when there's opportunities for me to sight fish, but there's other things playing. So guys aren't, and I hate to say it in the way, but it's hard to move around and have a lot of options when everybody is, is up there looking for sure. I feel like it always takes away when, you know, like I always thought people, I, I love throwing a chatterbait in college. And I remember whenever there was like, everyone was throwing a chatterbait in a tournament, I wouldn't be in the top 20, but when it was not like a prominent deal, I could go and get a top 20 on it. Cause it wasn't diluted. There wasn't so many people doing the same mm -hmm. thing. And so that's how I felt like with that, looking at the schedule, you might not have predicted it, but that's my one shining light this season was that for my drain the lake team, I pick every single roster for every lake ahead of time. And I didn't fall into the trap of Seminole, even though I wanted to pick you in your home body of water, I picked you for Murray. So thank you for winning the event that I picked you in. <laughs> I used you one time this year and we got the win there, but uh, that's my one shining light. But did you think being the day two leader and then going into day three and having your toughest day of the week that it, that it was leaving you or that you'd even have a, a, a puncher's chance on the final day? I know the weights were close, but that was such a dramatic swing of 23 a day, 23 a day to, to 14. And now you go from first to 10th and you're like, Am I going to be able to do this tomorrow? And obviously we know how that turned out. 
I didn't think it was leaving me. I just made a little bit of an error myself on day three. I, I fished uh, too much in some of the, the water that I had been fishing. And then when I did choose to expand and move to, to different pockets, I just got behind guys that were there that first part of the day and they caught, you know, the fish that were in those pockets. And I just, you have those days where you're just always one step behind, you know, your timing's off or, um, you know, your rotation's off. And it, that was just that day. Um, I just felt like um, it, at one point at the end of the day, I got behind Cook and you know you saw the, the the day he had um one or two of those fish and i don't have a bad day but then it's a two-edged sword i don't have that bad day i don't go fish a chad spawn and get off to a fast start i don't win the event so i wouldn't change anything how it went down but i didn't feel like it was going away i felt like i had the confidence to go catch a 20 pound bag you know still off bed but i didn't think i could catch a 26 or 27 pound bag to win the event. So that's the reason why I mixed in fishing with sight fishing on, on that last day. I wanted to ask you about that as well. The, you know, just tap into your mindset the after day three, because like Ronnie mentioned, you go from leading the tournament days one and two to, you know, falling to 10th. Going into that last day, just tell me about your mindset. I mean, I know that's that had to be a tough pill to swallow on day three, but for normal average fishermen, you go out there a day after struggling, it's really easy just to let it go and just let go of the rope. <laughs> but for you to go into that final day and go from 10 to surge to the top, like just tell me about your mindset, like what you were telling yourself the night before. Well, first I was so mad. I mean, I was more mad uh, day three and day four than I can ever remember being fishing. And it's just like, what the heck, Drew? I mean, you had this, everything was lining up and 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 you screwed it up. And, uh, you know, you look at the weights and you say, well, I'm only five pounds back. But on a place like Lake Murray, where everybody's catching them, it's really, that's a big lead. Um, uh, so I knew that doing what I was doing on days one and two and three, just that game plan wasn't, you know, the, the winning recipe. I just knew that. Um, and Brock Mosley kind of told me about a shad spawn deal. And he said they're on Rocky Points. He sent me a pin to something that he was fishing down the lake. He said, this is what you need to be looking for. So, you know, I run down the lake and uh, had me a Bagley Pro Sunny B Square Bill tied on. And the water's real clear. And the reason why I chose that bait is because it's something that you can burn really fast and get a reaction bite without those fish uh, seeing it too well, and they, I couldn't get them to bite a top water. It seemed like those fish were top water shot for whatever reason. But anyway, so I run down there. I'm just my mindset was get off to a fast start, like either catch a limit really quick to the point where I'm not stopping on uh, three and a half pounders that I see on bed, or catch a couple big ones, and then you've only got to find three big ones. You know that was my whole mindset with that game plan. And, and of course, I run down there. I ended up. I think I caught. I left there with two five pounders and two four and a half pounders and a four pounder. So I I felt like, you know, I've got a really, really good chance now if I just go find one really big one or two nice ones, I can win. And, you know, I left from there and, and stopped on a couple fish that I thought were the caliber I needed. They were a little bit deeper and then I would catch them and they'd be just a four pounder. And I'd be like, dang, I got a little bit better bag than I, I thought I had. And then I find that one great big one, and it's in like six foot of water. And uh, I remember Shane Durant was covering me. And uh, I turned the boat around. And I said, this is the one. And he goes, what do you mean? I was like, I catch this one, and I win the whole tournament. And he said, are you serious? And, and that was just, it. when you talk about a plan coming together and, and just working the way, you know, you dreamed it would happen um, that day four on Lake Murray was that I, I turned around there and caught that fish and, and then ended up culling uh, one of those four and a half pounders out. I, I caught a five pounder late in the day that I, I didn't need, but it, it, you know, it gave me a little bit more cushion, but um, yeah, I mean, it just worked out to a T. I think that that, you know, I think two years ago, uh, the May event at Lake Fork, 
we dubbed it the best 22 minutes alive because the first segment of Bassmaster Live on the final day, everyone caught a five pounder. Like it was just every camera was just we couldn't catch up quick enough. Everybody was catching at the same time. That final hour at Lake Murray with Hunter Schrock having the morning he had, you were right there. Kyoya still was one bite away from doing it. You had the guys like Walters and Cobb that were just spectacular blueback herring guys. You had Tox all around there. Cook had just caught a big one off a of dock. I there was legitimately five anglers with with one bite that could have won that event for being 10th place. Had you been in that position before where you were 10th and then all of a sudden you're in the last 45 minutes of the day and there's a photographer following you and you're like, I might win this event. You know, like that that's the only way you guys know is if the crowd grows, like you can think I've got 26 pounds, but if no one ever shows up, you don't you don't think you're still in the game. But when people start showing up in that last hour and photographers who are normally off the water are still covering the tournament, you had to kind of know as a seasoned vet, I need to catch this fish because this is this is the one, like you said. That's pretty bold to say, but it's you get those weird, weird chills when they keep rolling up following you. Well, too, you know, I've I've been around this position enough. I to be honest with you, I fudged on my way. You know, and I did that for a reason because I didn't need the boat traffic in those pockets as I was trying to sight fish. You know, I didn't need boats running in and out trying to take pictures while I'm, you know, trying to look deeper. And so I, I called them out a little bit lighter purposely, but I knew what I had and, and I knew <laughs> I was close. I knew I was one bite away. And you guys kind of called me out on it on live. He said, <laughs> he said he's got more than he says he's got. Oh, he's got a three, and I mean, six, and two, three, I, eights, but he just threw back a four. <laughs> so let's just put him up right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I hate to do that. But at the same time, it it makes that job so much easier when I don't have four or five people, you know, coming to look for me and 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 uh, in those small, tight areas. So I mean, it's just kind of what you got to do. <laughs> I mean, you can just say it. If it's a pain in the ass to have Shane Durant's covering you, I mean, just say it. We'll, we can just address it right here. No, no. I mean, I, all our all our team, kidding. all all our photographers are awesome. I, I, uh, they're they're very respectful and courteous, but it's just the amount of pressure in those areas. It's the Christie Classic. Have that. I, it's it's that yeah, factor. Yeah. I, it's just controlling the 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 controllables, and that's one thing that I can control. I can tell you that I got a lot less than I got to keep <laughs> guys away. <laughs> so so tell me about that that day three portion sorry kyle uh and no, just kind of keyed up in my mind you come in with your lowest weight of the week drew comes in with the biggest bag drew cook that is comes in with the biggest bag of the tournament at that point what was that discussion like in the house as you both make the top 10 he did it in the way that you were doing it like you said you got behind him uh, is it one of those deals where you guys kind of put your minds together? Obviously, Brock had told you about the Shad Spawn deal at the tanks, which helped give you a morning deal. But did you guys have to formulate some kind of plan of like, hey, because now all of a sudden you went from being the leader to now Cook's in a better position to win than you were because he had jumped above you. So it's one of those things that you guys have to say, like, I'm going to be in these creeks or this, these pockets and you got to be in those so we don't we don't follow each other. Is that kind of how it went or how did that go? Yeah, I kind of, um, at that point, again, I was really kind of mad at myself and thought I'd given it away, but I just said, where do you want, you know, where are you going to be? I'm going somewhere new. And that's the thing about Lake Murray. People don't realize, like I went to completely new water and sight fished that last day. And then um, with, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to go, I just want to get closer to takeoff. I went in a pocket right by a takeoff and found a five pound. So, I mean, you could find them from end to end. It just, you couldn't be behind another hammer sight fish. That's just the name of the game. And, and I just like, look, dude, just where are you going to be? I'm not going to be there. You know, or I'm going to be somewhere else and looking at new water. And that, that was just ultimately the, the game plan, at, you know, what we talked about. So I wanted to tap into that a little bit more. You kind of mentioned your, game plan there in the last day fishing new water when you go into a tournament like this or really like any sight fishing tournament but just use this one as an example how many sight fit or like fish on beds do you think you had before the tournament started and then of the ones you weighed in how many of them do you think you just found during the tournament uh so for that particular one i probably had somewhere upwards around 200 marked um but i of those two 
200, I probably only fished for about 20 of them. A lot of them were just those three pounders. And and once I saw the weights after the first day, see, going into a site event, I mark pretty much everything, you know, once I'm seeing a bunch of them, three pounds or bigger. Um, and once I saw the weights, I knew, you know, a lot of those were irrelevant. And uh, what was weird on the first day, I, I started on a female that was, um, it was kind of on the end of a lay down. So I started on her. So I needed kind of uh, a landmark to cast at because, you know, you can't see, can't see what's going on. And so I caught her pretty quick. And then my next three or four females I went to were all gone. And the the one that Dalton covered me on was I thought was a seven pounder. I went to it, didn't see it there, went and caught another one, came back and saw that fish about 30 yards from the bed, just sitting up there. It done went up there and laid. And I got that fish to bite three times the afternoon before the tournament started, like shook her off. So I knew she was catchable. And when she wasn't there, I'm like, here we go again. Well, when I rolled back in there the second time, the sun was up good. And I saw her just suspended just over the edge of the bar there, uh, about, like I said, 20 or 30 yards. I picked up a, a wacky rig trick stick and pitched it over there to her and uh, and got her to bite just sitting off by herself. So she had kind of done her thing. And that was the thing about Murray. Those fish were trickling in and out very rapidly. Like they would pull up and do their thing within a day, day and a half and be gone. So the females, for the most part, the ones that I caught that were females in that tournament, um, only about three of them I saw in practice. The rest of every every other female I found as the tournament went on and each day. Um, I caught a couple nice males that I had marked, but, um, you know, they're, they're kind of up there and committed. Um, they're either going to wait until a female comes up. Sometimes one never comes up, and they'll be there for weeks, you know. So it was just a matter of uh, – finding a, a couple big females each day. I think uh, I saw the comment online on one of the videos we posted on YouTube that said, and it was a kind comment. It's not like the normal comments. It was a good comment. Well, <laughs> the comment said, Drew didn't win this event sight fishing or with any specific bait. He won it with his power pole move because on day four, there was about a two hour period where every time we checked in on you, there was a wake about six <laughs> feet high of the waves you were pushing as you were flying down the banks, covering water, <laughs> looking for females. So tell us about how long of a time did you spend on that final morning fishing the shad spawn? You get your couple fours and couple fives. And then until you, the last hour of the day, when you find the six in that five, how many casts did you make in a day? Cause I feel as anglers, we're always antsy. If we're not making a cast, we can't catch a fish. But if we're, your probably mindset is if you're wasting casts on fish that won't win you a tournament, then you're just, it's like, if you're not fishing at all anyways, and you're, you buzz down the bank for a good portion of Lake Murray to look for the fish you were looking to, you needed. Yeah. So I guess it was about 1130 if I remember correctly, that was about the time the sun had got up. And, and the whole key to that, that shad spawn deal is the shade lines. And it could just be one single tree on a bank. It could be you know a little bit steeper bank, whatever the case may be. But it, if that shade was there, you could almost call your shot. It was either one or four fish sitting up there in that shade amb ambush and shad. And once the sun got up and that shade kind of went away, I couldn't get those fish to commit. I don't know if they were seeing my bait too well. They weren't setting up the same, what the case may be. But I I started just getting a lot of followers. So at that point, I'm like, it's time to change gears. I went looking and I kept a, a big swim bait in my hand. Uh, it was a line through Scottsboro swim bait. And what I would do is every time I'd go, there's a ton of docks on Lake Murray. And every time I would go around the end of a dock or buzz in there to look in a corner, I would flip that swim bait around and actually on day one, one of my fish I weighed in was on that bait. It was a like four and three quarter doing that. And another thing that it's good for is a fish that is on bed down there deep. You can't see sometimes they'll come up and show themselves. So I was kind of making pitches around, but it wasn't necessarily to catch one. It was, it was more of a search bait. And if, you know, you got lucky and one big one was sitting under the corner of a dock or in the shade and they come out and ate it. That was good, too. But my number one plan was to side fish and, and, and find one or two big ones. So I kept it on on wide open and I covered as much water as I could. 
think you probably covered Kyle on that final day more miles than Brian New did on day one when he ran around 128 miles on his big motor. I think <laughs> Drew did that on his trolling motor this week. But um, go ahead, Kyle. I just wanted to, I wanted to ask him about his trolling motor because he was busting it on that final day. Those things are really fast. That's no sponsor plug here. I've covered a few guys with them, and it's incredibly hard to keep up with. That's You're like on sure. pad, on pad to keep covering them. <laughs> You know, yeah, you used to be... go through no wake zones with that trolling motor. You have to turn it down to about five. No, used to be, out of all honesty, I would shut down if I wanted to go across the pocket and, and I would idle across the pocket. But I can troll just as fast as I can idle across the pocket now. It's, <laughs> it's unreal. Well, Drew, the one thing I was going to ask you there, you've mentioned a few of your baits that you played. Just give us a rundown, like top to bottom, you know, the baits that played for you in this event. Obviously, uh, I think we all just expect at this point you're going to have a Texas rig with a, a fighting frog and tilapia magic, but give us give us the rest of the rundown of uh, what you were using there at Lake Murray. Yeah, that was that fighting frog was the meat potatoes um, for sight fishing. If I found one that was finicky um, or one that you know maybe it was I was kind of like eh, I don't know if it's going to help me. I wanted to try to catch it fast. I would p- pitch that uh, drop shot with cliffhanger worm in there. It's a uh, it's like a little hand poured worm that that uh, uh, Clifford Perch design from Big Bite. It's got that sensation in it. I just feel like that sensation, man, it, it's something special. Like if a fish gets within an inch of that thing, it's going to bite it. Same with the, the trick stick, the wacky rig trick stick that I was throwing. I'm throwing the sensation version of that. It's not out yet. And man, it gets a lot of bites. Um, I caught some fish on those three baits. Um, and I also mixed in uh, caught a, a nice one on top water one day. I was throwing a reaction innovations vixen when I caught it. Um, like I said, that line through swim bait I caught, uh, Scottsboro, um, line through swim bait I caught one on. Um, and then that last day uh, on the shad spawn, that Bagley Pro Sunny Bee in that olive shad color burning it down those rocks. That was um, a kind of a variety of baits, but I would say uh, really three of them did the heavy lifting in that, that Bagley crank bait. The, the cliffhanger and the uh fighting frog when you were talking about the shad spawn it was interesting to me when we saw brock on day three catching them on live just missing the day four cut but catching them on live on the on his square bill um i think with bill lewis and they were just choking it and then the next day we see you and we find out you know you had a discussion with him you were throwing the square bill um when you said that they were top water shy do you think that's just from from pressure or that they had been doing the shad spawn so long or that, you know, like it it's one of those things if the shad spawn just starts, you can probably catch him on it. But had it been going that strong that they had seen that many top waters or what? Because you'll see the soft plastic jerk baits come into play, walking top waters, the plopper and chopo styles. And then obviously when you have like a little bit of grass, bank grass, you can throw a swim jig, spinner bait, stuff like that. But to see a square bill and to see a one that, you know, the way they were getting it, uh, it was very interesting because I would have probably never thrown that on the shad spawn. I would have tried everything else and then just said, heck with it. I'm going to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot of it had to do with we were taking off, I think, a little too late um, for for that top order. I think it, I think for that lake that gets that much pressure because everybody fishes the points. I mean, and there was actually a local tournament going on and I was fishing behind guys and I was watching them throw top orders and not getting bites. Like, I remember starting on a point and there was two local boats, the next two points that I wanted to fish that I was looking down through there and they were all throwing top orders and walking baits. And when I got that first bite on the crankbait, I went behind them and caught fish and I just stuck with it. You know, had I seen them catch one or, you know, I actually threw a top order a couple of times across those, those points and didn't get any bites, had some followers, didn't get any bites. And that was kind of the deal if I wasn't like super shallow, like say up there where their fish were spawning, I couldn't get them to commit to a top order. And those fish that were on those deeper points, and that's what this rip rap deal was. It was deeper, like four to six foot, you know, depth range. And I just couldn't get them to come up and commit to them, whatever the case may be. Uh, I just, I couldn't get it, I could, couldn't get it to go. So. So Drew obviously got um, a few more events this season left. It was interesting talking to Cook at the Wheeler Open this past week, uh, and he said that every single event until Lake Wheeler, Wheeler Lake, 
he had caught a fish off bed, but it looks like we're finally getting to the part of the season where, um, you know, that might not be the player at Sabine. Who knows? You guys always prove us wrong on that. Uh, but just the rest of the season, obviously you're sitting good in AOI right now, top 20. Um, just give us your outlook on the rest of the season uh, moving forward. Um, realistically, I just want to have a solid finish at Sabine so we can go up north and have fun. Um, north, The northern swing is a lot of fun. It's stressful to fish tournaments because everybody catches them. And you can be so close to a top 10 and completely miss the 50 cut just because the weights are stacked so tight. And the fact that everybody's going to kind of catch them and, and figure the deal out because the fishing's so good up there. And that's just kind of a testament to the way it sets up. Those fish don't see a bait like they do down here where we've been fishing 12 months out of the year. They see them about three to four months out of the year. And uh, it's a lot of fun to go up there, but I don't want my season and my point standings and all that to be in balance when we go up there. So um, if we can do our job down at Sabine and, and come out of there with a solid finish and, and uh, not really put it on cruise control, but we'll be fishing a whole lot more relaxed up north. And, and that's kind of, you got to kind of take risk and, and, and gamble a little bit to, to set yourself apart and turn some of those mediocre finishes into top tens up there, I feel like. And, and uh, if we can, if we can do that and stay in the top 20 in points. Uh, I think we'll be in good shape. Last thing, Drew, before we let you go, uh, when you wrapped up, you know, you, you had done your job on the water, you had bagged up your fish, you're getting out of your boat and you hop up on the stage for the weigh in you had a great weigh-in speech about the motivation and encouragement that your wife gave you in a simple note. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit of that again? Because that was such a cool story um, and aspect of it, something that's very relatable to a lot of people. Um, but just also on the water, we had talked on the phone later and you had said something to me that that maybe not wasn't mentioned there, if you don't mind sharing, that was pretty impactful uh, in your boat as well. Yeah, so, you know, out. Like I said, I was angry um, after day three. My wife's really good about building me back up, being a good cheerleader and, and trying to to get me back mentally where I need to be. And, and like right before we took off, she handed me a note and I stuck it in my bibs, took it off and, and fished the first point, caught one, fished another couple points and didn't really catch much. And... I was starting to, you know, kind of doubt that deal a little bit. And I'm like, I'm going to go up here and fish this, this next one. And while I'm idling up there, I pull that note out and I read it. And it was basically uh, four or five Bible verses saying, put all your faith in God and don't doubt yourself and kind of believe it to be, and it will be, you know, and just, you know, use what, you got use the tools that you know the knowledge you know and just go forth and freaking make it happen it's, it's kind of what it told me at that time and went up there and freaking caught a five pounder the first cast on this next point and just started rolling and like i hooked one in the back had one treble hook hooked it in the back followed it around the boat for like three minutes had to sit down trim my motor up so it didn't get hung in it caught that fish and I'm like I don't know if it's my day but it feels like my day and put him in the box made the decision to go sight fishing I need a six pounder find a six pounder catch the six pounder <laughs> and uh then you know it's just like is this really happening you know and, and, and you can't explain it and this is the the type of stuff I'm saying when you say you don't know when these winds are coming and you, you can't predict it but when stuff like that is happening and it's going your way, you feel like nothing can stop you. And uh, we went to another pocket and I handed that note to Dave Pennington and me and him have shared the boat for several events. I mean, he's, he was with me when I finished second at Harris chain and um, we have a, a great relationship and he read that note, man, he, he teared up. He said, man, that's powerful. And just the, the weight of that in that moment and what it did for my confidence was just huge. So it's just uh, it's something that I'll always remember and, and cherish. And uh, it was just a really a cool moment. I love the Bible verse. I think it's 1 John 1, 6, Kyle. And it says, 
trust in the Lord. You're going to catch a freaking five pounder. That's my favorite Bible verse. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> that's, that's the one I'm putting on my windshield forever. But Drew, that is that was fantastic. I loved it. What a great win. Congratulations. Your second elite title uh, It's one that we it may be dubbed as the best elite tournament of the year so far. So enjoy it. Uh, super cool. Thank you for joining us today on the Winning Ways episode of your victory and of Luke Palmer's win. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Drew Benton, our fourth elite or our third elite series winner of the season. He uh, took his second title there, Kyle. A super cool story there, man. To think that you've got your your main bullet in the gun and that you're leading the event with and then to feel like you blew it and then to just have that refocus and to take it on the final day that's pretty pretty dang awesome for drew benton and so um he's been on a big time tear he he won in 2018 hadn't won since then fourth in aoy though last year and like he said a second at the harris chain some other great finishes along the way uh, he is due for a classic, which he was close for this year. He's due for an AOI. He is one that uh, when he gets on a hot streak, man, whether it's spawning fish or not, man, it's, that's a little dangerous. I think that that's one thing you and I talked about maybe the last time we had a podcast, you know, right after his win, or maybe we just talked about it just texting. I don't remember, but it was crazy to watch him win just a few short weeks after what happened at the classic. You know, you could tell he was, he was, noticeably emotional on the stage about um you know having the bites to win there on the final day and you come back in and see that you know gussie has struggled and all these guys ahead of you have struggled and you had the opportunity to win the classic and that's just devastating like that's a hard pill to swallow for any angler i mean in any tournament but much less the classic um and then to see him turn around and then obviously win the very next elite series tournament the way that he did in the fashion, you know, that he did on the final day, uh, it was really special. And you could just feel it on that, that final day during weigh in. Um, that was a, a really, really special win and you couldn't help, but uh, feel happy for Drew Benton. It's always really cool when someone catches the biggest bag of the tournament on the final day to do something like that it always seems to work out that way. Now, speaking of the biggest bags of the week and things like that, Luke Palmer winning the fourth Elite Series event of the year at Santee Cooper Lakes, got a fourth place finish in 2022, comes back this year and gets the win in dramatic fashion. I'd say dramatic in terms of how big his victory was, not like last second win, but milestone historic deal for Luke. And you can speak to this as well. He's kind of been put in that bucket with the Brock Mosleys of the world, guys who are just ever so rock solid and steady that just haven't gotten an elite series breakthrough for a win. And they've either came up close, came up short, or just that guy's got the recipe based on his track record to have a really successful career. Yeah, there's so many guys. I mean, that's the thing is you're talking about nine elite series tournaments and then the classic and, you know, I mean, obviously some of the guys fish the opens too, but there's only so many opportunities to win. So every time you're inside the top 10 going into the final day, I mean, that's like if you're reasonable and you're not, you know, having just a Brandon <laughs> Cobb-like season, like, you know, like this might be my best chance all year to win. And obviously Luke has been in that position a few times. Um, and I can just remember talking to him after day three when he finally led the tournament and he was like, I can't believe believe I'm finally leading one of these dang things. Like, like going into the final day. So um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of guys that are in that same bucket. And you think like, it's not really a matter of if, but just when, like eventually, like you're, you're getting so many opportunities, so many opportunities, like it's going to come through sometime. And obviously uh, Luke Palmer left no doubt on the final day. It was a, uh, it was quite the final day when everybody else was was more or less struggling. He was still <laughs> sacking up uh, a big bag. So it was uh, it was fun to be there in person and, and cover him on the water. It was a, a special win to get to see in person and especially for you know somebody like Luke that I'm definitely you know close with for sure. Well, let's go ahead and add in Luke Palmer to the podcast episode for the winning ways of his event because it was, like you said, a fantastic tournament at Santee Cooper Lakes, getting a little bit of revenge for Luke Palmer. And I'm kind of here with the two golden children of Bassmaster right now, Luke Palmer, and then you got the photographer capturing it all, Kyle Jesse. So Kyle, I'm going to let you take it away. And you two, you just go ahead and, and have your discussion about how good Luke Palmer's week was at Santee because it was phenomenal. 
Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I'd say uh, Luke was a big fan of the week as well. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna guess that he was okay with it. And uh, Luke, we were just talking about before you joined the fact that I, I remember talking to you after day three, and you were like. I can't believe I'm finally leading one of these freaking things. Like it was just almost a relief that you were, you were ahead, like, at, you know, going into the final day, like, tell me about how that felt, you know, after day three, you know, everybody says, Oh, I don't want to be leading going into day four. No, I don't want to do that. BS. That means they've got to catch you. I mean, cause I don't, I mean, don't I, all you always want to be in the hunt for something, but dude, every time someone gets a lead, that's more pounds I got to catch, you know, catch up instead of, you know, if say Mark was in front of me by three pounds and he catches 24, well, I got to catch 27, you know, I mean, it's, that's a whole lot better not have to catch that extra fish instead of having to come from behind. But it was nice. I've, like I said, I've never led one. <laughs> I'd been close. I'd been second, third, a few times. And finally just getting lead one. That was kind of cool. We could have ended the tournament that day and I'd been fine with it. Well, I, I just remember on Bassmaster Live, we started early in the morning with you. Normally, we have 30 minutes or an hour before you guys are live, but I think we were live on Facebook right when you were taking off, and we got to see your morning interview on the final day. And, I mean, boy, if you didn't move your mouth this much when you were talking, you were like, yeah, I'm ready to get going. I, I hope we win today. You were you seemed super <laughs> nervous yet super calm. You were like, I think it's going to happen. I think – you know what? I want it to happen. I want to have a good day. What was that like idling out with some of the best anglers on Santee Cooper behind you and some of the best sight fishermen, some of the best, whatever it was a stud of a field. I mean, you had the Matt Robertson who had channeled just enormous fish the previous couple of days, Brandon Polinick, who's won here before and gotten top fives, Drew Cook, the same thing. You Mark Menendez, who had surged out of nowhere. There was a lot of good anglers there but you just seemed determined and, and about as calm, cool, and collected as you could be. You know, I, I really was. I Everybody's like, did you sleep? I was in bed at like 9.30. I was asleep, woke up at 4.30, like nothing ever. I mean, it was just a – it was a God's timing deal, you know, as well as I do. Whenever it's meant for you to win and it's his timing, you're not going to be nervous because if you're nervous about things, you're not going to perform right or I don't. So it was just kind of like, hey, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to fish as hard as I possibly can for the next eight or ten hours, whatever it is. And, you know, so may be it. If it's my time to win, I'm going to win. Because I've been in the position every year since I've been on the leads, I've had opportunities to win a tournament. Um, for instance, like at the Classic at yeah, Hartwell, I lose a five-pounder every single day of the tournament. Well, you know as well as I do, a five-pounder is absolute gold at Hartwell. You know, and to do that every day, you know, it wasn't my time. So it, it was a, it was one of those deals where I, I told Aaron, you know, my buddy that fought, you know, travels with me, script check. He, we just, I think he was more nervous than I was. Like we're driving in the truck and I'm like, play some dang music. Like he's sitting over just quiet, like looking straight forward. And I was like, dude, you're going to have to chill out. And I said, it's just, a, it's just a tournament. He's like, yeah, but you got a chance to win this tournament. I said, dude, we're going to go. We're going to have a good time. I'm just just chill out. Like, play some music. He was, I've never seen him that nervous. He's ever. like driving he was, on he was, death, death row over he here. He was over something. there. He was like sitting there, like hands moving. I'm like, dude, chill out. Like, calm down. Get the camera out. Video something. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Do your job. Let's man. Enjoy this. <laughs> That's it. Well, speaking of Aaron doing his job, I feel like one story that needs to be told is is what happened on day one with the uh, the GoPro situation. I want you to one, tell that story, and then it seemed like that story basically set the tone for it being your time. So I just want you to run through that story because I don't know if that's been told or not. Okay, so day <laughs> day one, I'm late. Not I. I mean, I'm about seventy something, so I'm not like super big hurry. Aaron is so anal about getting up when he'd be there 45 minutes before put it in i'm like and i'm like still sleeping he's out there getting the boat ready and uh so we get going we get there and, and i dump in at 6 43 and aaron looks at me he goes oh crap i was like what i don't have the gopros they're in the bag i said in the truck he said no at the camper which is at patrick walter's house which is a 45 minute drive and it, it is probably, what, a 10-minute boat ride, you know, if you run the channel. 
Well, at 652, we can't find a GoPro and Bass requires us to run a GoPro. I tell my marshal, I said, we'll be back to get you. He's like, where are you going? I said, to get GoPros across the lake. And he's like, you're kidding. Nope. I said, Aaron, put your lock jacket on and put your head down. <laughs> we literally ran straight out of Potato Hills. at Potato Hills, I guess. Straight across to Utahville Creek, which is not the boat lane. <laughs> and I mean, I have never been so drawn up in my whole life running. I had that boat. I had my Bob's Jack play all the way up. And I had it trimmed out, and I was just holding on for dear life. I was like, God, please don't let us hit anything. And I think my boat was out of the water more than it was in it because it was rough the first day. And Aaron is just, he can look at him over there in the seat, and he is just white-knuckled on that chair and never raises his head up. Because, you know, as well as I do, it's solid timber out there. And we ran all the way over there, ran into the creek. He grabs the, the GoPros out, and we get back in. We're going across, and... I seen one stump. There was a wave that went down and it exposed the stump, and I was dead center to it. And I just kind of done the old shimmy of the old boat around it and went around. Aaron was, what was that? I said, nothing. And we <laughs> rolled up. Close your eyes. I think I kicked my guy out, or I kicked Aaron out at boat 66. I cut the line, got in front, and I pulled out one rod. Lisa was like, boat 74, Luke. And I was like, well, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> now you got a quarter, of, then a quarter Aaron, of a gallon left or a quarter of a tank left of gas. Yeah. Cause it, <laughs> yeah. And Aaron, he was, he stressed all day. I know he did because he's like, and I didn't have a fish at 130 on day one. So I'm sure he was like, it's all my fault. I ruined the tournament. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying I was thinking the same thing too, but, you know, I mean, he wasn't mean to leave him. So it really wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, except that we ran all the way across the lake and we could have ripped my whole lower unit off my boat or destroyed it. <laughs> and, you know. And none of it would have been on I camera. Like, I mean, unbelievable. No. <laughs> yeah. We would have missed every bit of it. He was wanting, he's like, dude, I was going to pull my phone out and film it, but I was, he said, I couldn't. He said it was so daggum rough, and, and he's like, I just didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> I don't think your State Farm agent wanted to see that footage anyways. But, no, um, he would have left that out. <laughs> tell us about that, because you had gone, you had probably circled Santee Cooper on the mat, on the schedule, because last year you had a top five there. You had done very well doing something similar. Did you develop that pattern again, or did you just trust that this area was going to produce like it did before? You just go and get in this area and figure it out because at one thirty on day one, when you don't have a fish, but you ended up winning the tournament kind of the same exact way you did previously. Did it just take you that long to wise up, or had you had gone through every terrible tree in the creek and you finally found the five good trees you needed? Well, I mean, it, it kind of was it. I did. I only had two bites in practice. I might have said one, but I had two bites in practice off of trees. One the first day and one on day three. That was it. I mean, I went around Marion. I went to the bottom lake. I really wanted to fish the stump hole. That's why I really wanted to catch them at, really. I went up there and I spent five hours up there and never got a bite, which was, again, a blessing in disguise because that's where I wanted to go. And uh, on I came one, back down. On day one, you spent five on, hours up there. On practice, in practice. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But I never got bit doing that. I mean, I couldn't get bit on trees in practice. But what I was getting bit on was the eelgrass. And I caught a fish up seven, over seven every single day that week, even in practice, tournament, and everything. And every one of them came out of the eelgrass. And uh, and when I seen that, you know, it was going to be cooler, I was like, okay, this could work. You know, it's maybe these fish are coming to me. Um, because the ones I were catching were really white, like they had just – maybe come out of the deep water and we're moving. So I was thinking, I told Aaron, I said, I think I can catch 25 to 35 pounds doing this if I stay with it all day long. Cause I do it for four hours and practice and get, you know, two or three, four bites, then just kind of leave it. Cause I didn't want to keep, you know, didn't want people to see me out there doing it, which there was guys doing it anyway. Um, but on day one, when I had not got a bite, no, I, I had a few bites at 10 o'clock. I lost five fish in a row on a buzz bait. I lost one that was in between six and eight. A four pounder, about two and a half or three, and a two pounder. I'm like, there's my there century belt. This is, <laughs> yeah, no joke. Like, gone. And then when I, I pulled up to a, I went back to the grass spot that I started on that I thought was the juice. And I went down the trees, never got a bite. And there's a tree that I have got, a, I've caught a fish off of every time we've been there. And they're normally not a big ones. I went out there, I flipped on that tree. Boom, I catch a two and a half pounder. I was like, even my marshal, he's like, oh my gosh, he didn't blank. You know, and uh, I scoped out there and I was like, heck, there's another one out there. 
about four flips later, boom, catch a three and a half. I'm like, hey, hey, at least we caught two. We're not dead last. And then I pulled up to a tree that I shook a fish off on Wednesday. Didn't catch a fish on it and went to the next one. I caught a seven and a half and like a three and a half and a four. I mean, it was like, all right, I know what to do now. Well, I thought that next day I go back to the eelgrass pattern and it didn't pay off again. But I went to the next two trees down. I catch another seven and then a five and then a three. And then it was just like Katie barred the door after that. I, it was, but all the trees that I caught them off of, I could never replicate it each day. Like, you know, everybody's talking about magic trees i think there was one tree would be loaded one day and then i would never catch another fish off that for the next four days hmm. which you think what is it's got to be special that tree that to have that many fish off of it and just maybe they all name the tree and that's the only one they can spawn on until they go back out now they're having to spawn in potato creek or not potato but yeah jc yeah all the so, uh all the females on that tree were using one male and he had to just do their bed when he was done the next one pulled up do their bed and it was just one guy getting put to work for all the big females was, that's pretty much what it was too it was i've never i've never seen what you know in our part of the world it's like, like two fish use a bed and that's it and the whole hey, lake you know no, I'm I'm talking, on a good day yeah, on a good day <laughs> you know i was talking to cook and he's like man he said i pulled up and i catch like a three off a of bed and then i catch the other one then another one pulls up there i catch it and then another one pulls up there and he said it's that's just, a, it's different down there. I don't know if it's, I mean, they got, got plenty of good bottom to spawn on, I think. I mean, there's a lot of sand still, but I don't know. It was, it was one of the deals whenever you, whenever you finally find what's going on and you're clued into it, it makes it look like it's so much easier than it was. I mean, because Kyle got to sit there and I'll never forget, I think it was a day three. I finally caught that seven. And he was like, this is the most boring, funnest thing I've ever done in my entire life. He said, you're not, it's not like you're not catching fish. He said, it's just, you're looking at one fish and you're flipping on it for an hour to catch it. And, by, the time, I mean, by the time he got done fishing for that one fish, I think I'd watched every new TikTok possible. I read, <laughs> I read every story on Bassmaster.com. I mean, I'd done about everything. And I just eventually looked up and he sets a hook. And I'm like, holy cow, he finally caught it. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle's watching Unreal. Bassmaster live just to see some other people fishing for a change while he waited. <laughs> oh, it, 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 was, it was tough. I mean, which that fish that on day three morning, all I had, to, I didn't know where the bed was. And all I did was move my boat. And as soon as I repositioned, it was like, I, I was dragging the bait. I thought where she was at, well, heck, I was pulling it through the bed quicker than she could even get to it. So as soon as I moved the boat, it was like, okay, game over. I mean, instantly she acted stupid and bit. Just, so it was I a wanna, learning lesson. I want to get into some of that, some of the details. And, you know, you and I have talked about it a handful of times since, but, you know, kind of to backtrack a little bit, every day of the tournament at way and I, mo I mocked you because you told me in practice that you just weren't catching anything. So when I saw him every day, I'd say, Oh, I'm not catching anything. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that from Kyle before. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, maybe you don't even know, like maybe you've, you've pieced it together by now or like maybe it's just, just happened, but what changed? I mean, like, what was it that made, you know, that not be there in practice, which I firmly believe you. It wasn't because I was mocking you. I didn't believe you. <laughs> to like like during the tournament like it finally started happening was it some condition change like you you talked about sun a lot like what do you think it was that actually made those fish finally appear where you wanted them to be but you know in practice it was cold i consider it cold it was didn't it get in the 40s a few days and oh. that's what i was and that's what I, I was like okay well we, now we have a bunch of eelgrass if those fish aren't in the trees they got to be in the eelgrass and I couldn't get bit flipping trees, man. I'm serious. I, I made laps around that lake. And I didn't want to fish in the same area again, honestly. You know, which I only had one good day out of that area. It wasn't like I caught them there. I caught one or two there each day, but they were just three pounders. Um, but I, I didn't really want to fish in there because there wasn't a bunch of fish in there. And in practice, I couldn't get bit out of it. I mean, it was strictly, and it was even like last year done the same thing in practice couldn't hardly get a bite and then all of a sudden it was like ta-da here's the best section in the entire lake you know besides the 500 yards of cook head but it was it was i'm 
I'm a firm believer it was the sun because in practice it was cold or cooler, and I don't think they were up there as good. But I mean, I talked to Cook and them; they're all seeing giants on beds everywhere. But I don't have X-ray vision, so that's fun. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think they like part the waters and they show up and they can just see it. <laughs> but uh, you know, I didn't do that. I seen some fish, but nothing I could get comfortable doing. And I'm like, if I can see them, everybody else can see them because I'm just not not a good sight fish and don't know what to look for as well. But uh, and but when that sun came out on that day one, and I didn't have a bite, and all of a sudden it was like the activity went nuts around the trees like the perch you could see them swimming around them they were getting higher in the water column and i really think that's what pushed those fish to the trees because they don't necessarily have to have the trees except when they're feeding or spawning so they could just be out cruising and now with the eelgrass as predominant as it is they can just hang out and sun comes out then they can pull up and they have the shade of that tree to you know hide from them i guess drew One before thing. oh go ahead i was good uh, uh, Ronnie, I was going to mention before Luke got on here, we had Drew Benton on, and he mentioned that during the Lake Murray tournament, he had over 200 fish marked. <laughs> Have you ever in your life seen 200 fish on bed? <laughs> it was insane. On day three of practice, on the end of day two, I seen some. And day three, I was like, oh, my gosh. I didn't even look until like 11. And I think I had 35 or 40 marked. That were over three pounds, which a three pounder was trash, you know. So it was, it was, Mr. it was the Mr. Very... 51 knows that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, stupid 51. <laughs> so depressed. Hey, you were and so consistent. A... You were 50th after day one and 51st after day two. You're so consistent, but that's just the wrong, the wrong formula. You need to flip that. Yeah. I, this has been a trying year. I'm not going to lie. Like, I ain't wrong. I won one and that's, awesome i mean i'm still pumped up about it but it's like this has been my most trying year i've never missed this many cuts since i've been on the leads you know and uh it's getting aggravating not gonna lie i'm hoping when aaron drops the new youtube here this neck this week that uh it'll get me pumped back up to win one and go down and i'd like to top 10 sabine that would be I, i'd rather just win it you know <laughs> but it uh it, it it's going to play to where I'm going to down there. It's, I'm going back to Luke braid braid and more braid. And, you know, I mean, I might set the hook and air mail everything that I hit, but you know, <laughs> but, that's fine. but I'm going to let it eat down there. Well, Kyle was talking about this and there's a couple different aspects to your win. The, the area you were fishing, the type of cover with trees, but then the technology you were utilizing, um, you, seeing them with your forward facing sonar, live scope, all that, all that jazz. But then my, as an old school fisherman that doesn't use that technology and, and, and stuff like that, the thing that I was most intrigued on was when we're flipping, oftentimes we want to switch color. We want to switch profile, but we rarely switch weight size. Because we think, oh, I'm going to flip these bushes with half ounce. I'm going to flip this tree with, with three, three eighths ounce. And that's just what we do. And that's the one thing we guarantee is going to work. And we just switch the bait when we don't get bit. Well, for you, you had three different setups, three different weights, but the same bait profile, the same color for all of them. So explain when you pick that up, or is that something that you you often do in Oklahoma or when you travel the Elite Series? Because that is, I saw you, you know, in the you know the the footage after the fact and alive when you're shaking that thing and it's the heavier version it's not moving versus when you have you know one little move and the the lighter version moves so talk to us a little bit about that your weight choice and how you kind of came to that conclusion you know like you said i, I used to be a diehard three eighths or half ounce that's all i was going to do and just covering water is what i when i was flipping a lot i would just cover water and, you know if i could make ten thousand flips throughout a day Hopefully I'd run across five dumb fish and they bite. That was always my plan. But I've got to notice and, you know, fishing more, you kind of have to you experiment with things. And with live scope, you can flip a three sixteenths out there and see how fast it falls. You can flip a quarter and see how fast in a five sixteenths. That's actually really fast. You go putting in four foot of water or less, it gets to the bottom in a hurry. Um, uh, and I was able to see how my bait's reacting, you know, whenever, uh, you know, you 
talking about the fish and how they're setting up last year when I was there, I could not get bit on a five sixteenths or a three eighths. I wanted to because I could cover more trees with that. And I, and if I found a fish I thought was spawning, well, I could put, flip it in there and it, I could aggravate them faster. No, that thing would fall in front of them and they would ease off. And I was like, well, that's not good. So I would, I would change to three sixteenths or a quarter. And it was like complete utter chaos when you flipped in there it was like you would instantly make them mad because the way that woolly bug would just glide in instead of just straight down in front of them which is normally what we wanted you know to get a reaction well not these fish they didn't like that i don't know if it's because we didn't have much wind um, but whenever i in this year the lighter weights i caught them pretty good doing it probably probably six ah, maybe 60 percent of my fish especially earlier in the week i caught on the quarter and three sixteenths um but when those fish started getting a little more protective of their beds, I could just pitch it fat past it, bring it over there. And I would find in each one of those trees where the bed was, there was one single cypress knee, every single one of them. It wouldn't be very tall. It would just be that one little hard spot there. And I could, when I'd pull that bait through there and I'd feel, I'd finally get hung up. I'd be like, all right, I know exactly what flip I've got to make now. And I'd flip up there and I'd bring up to that knee and it would just sit there and you'd watch me. I'd shake and shake and shake and shake. And then, and finally you could watch those fish. They'd get mad. And they would just curve up on it. Then it was ball game. But like uh, I said, when I throw the lighter, go ahead. No, I was going to say, was there another aspect to it? One way we can affect our soft plastics is by pegging it or unpegging it or having a loose peg, you know, up the line a little bit. So the weight actually separates from it and allows it to kind of do that compared to just being all together and going down. Did you experiment with that or how did you have the weight to bait? Was it pegged or not? Yeah, no, I peg, I always peg my weights. Like I'm just not one that doesn't, um, I like my weights to be close to my worm. Um, so I would, you know, it might be a quarter inch above it, but primarily, you know, I want it to be right there with it um, because I don't want it to, I want my bait to be right there on my weight so I can feel everything that's going on. I don't want any separation from it. And like you said, though, it does make your bait fall completely different whenever you do separate your weight from your bait. Um, but I didn't, I wanted to, I wanted to have complete control of where my bait was going and what I was doing with it. Luke, one thing I wanted to mention, because I, I still find this fascinating. Obviously, I got to watch you, I've got to watch you do it now for four days over the course of two Elite Series competition um, there at Santa Cooper. But just explain to us what you're seeing on your screen. You know, obviously you're you're using forward-facing sonar to see these fish. And I feel like I can already see the comments below the YouTube video of people saying, forward-facing through and fishing. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I just <laughs> I just want you to like explain at least like remotely what you were looking at because I feel like that's such a unique thing. You know, people view live scope as something where you just get out in the middle of the lake and just roam around until you see one on the screen. But you were just utilizing it to see the structure, see, you know, potentially the fish, like explain how you were using that without giving too much away. Cause it seems like you've uh, obviously tapped into something a whole lot of people are not doing. I don't know what you're talking about. I was using just regular cane pole, just stick it out there and do it. 2D of... was key this week for sure. Yeah. I, I have mine 2D and I turn it on the front of my trolling motor. So it shoots 2D. At yeah. the tree. Uh, uh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. What color palette? Now, I, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It was, you know, what? a lot of those fish, everybody thinks I caught every one off scope. And I caught quite a few, but I did. The big fish, 90% of the time was the first fish that bit. I would never, I wouldn't even get to the tree and scope it yet. And just, they would bite. The female would bite, like I said, 90% of the time first. So, I mean, you really didn't have to have scope. You just had to, you had to put it, just be the right tree to put it in front of them. I mean, you could make, if you were there, you could make, 10 flips on a tree and nine times out of 10 you'd probably catch one or two fish off of it every you'd time have to, you'd have to have but, the confidence to know that maybe i should pitch back in there a couple more times to try to see if there's more or that kind of thing yeah yeah you know and that was that was my thing with the scope i mean i i really i mean i'd watch my bait once i figure out where the fish were at and you didn't even have to have it uh, but to know that there was four fish sitting on that tree or two fish that tree that I caught all of them up on off on day four, there ended up being six fish on that tree. I came back that afternoon before the 800 mile an hour wind hit 
and there was two there and they wouldn't they wouldn't sit up they would just kept swimming by it and they were chasing stuff now if i would have had if i wouldn't have had 25 pounds i'd have probably sat there and really just worked on them but and then the wind hit and i was like this is not good and we're just dinging lightning everywhere so we went to the trees um but when i was looking at them i wouldn't look for fish i'd look for some movement on the tree um and you're not going to be able to see all of them uh because on day three i think it was whenever kyle and sago were sitting on me and i i went by this tree and i actually got close to it and I didn't see anything because there was grass all the way around it, and I got close to it and I just so happened to see a blob move out of the grass. And, and I told them, I said, there's two on this tree and I circled back around and caught them both. But it was just looking for movement around the trees off your scope. I'm not, I don't have my graph probably set up crystallized clear like some people do. Um, I just, I've used mine so much here in Oklahoma fishing, smaller ponds, smaller lakes, and crappie fishing with it and i've i mean i've worked with it a lot and we don't fish water over three foot water here in oklahoma nine 12 months out of the year you know i mean that's just and uh but all i do is look for a blob and look for movement because it's got to be something it's going to be a carp or a bass or you know something so just looking for movement on the scope that's that was the main thing because i can't see the tail can't you know tell how exactly how big they are you know when you're up in three four foot of water so it it's just it's it's tougher, but I've gained confidence in doing it. That's the key to ever. I mean, just like Taku, he's he could he would just soon go sit out in the middle of the lake and fish in fifteen to thirty foot of water with scope, and I get scared when I get out that deep. <laughs> I have to wear a life jacket on the front deck. So, I mean, that's that's kind of my deal. I you know I like to fish shallow. That's what I've always done, and and it's just been another tool to use up shallow. I mean, it's, I talked to, well, I was over the Falcon Challenge this year at Grand the other day, and Mike McClellan was there, and I was talking to him, and he said, man, he said, I did kind of the same thing, he said, but I was throwing a little brown jig, he said, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have scope, obviously, back then, he said, but it was very similar, he said, I would catch multiple fish off each tree, you know, so. Well, and I can, just a I can attest to that too. We can just go ahead and defend the YouTube comments because there were certainly plenty of the fish, like you said, that were not affiliated with LiveScope at all. Like last year, that the almost ten pounder, I know for a fact you weren't looking at anything. You weren't even paying attention. <laughs> he was cutting up with you behind the boat the whole time. Like, yeah, <laughs> so like, it's not like it. It was necessary. Like you, like I was trying to like make the point of you're using it as a tool to just help you understand what was around the trees, what, you know, rather than, you know, like you, like I said, just roaming around the middle of the lake, just looking for one isolated fish and just following him. Like it was, it was a tool. You're using it as a tool. And that's just kind of the point I was trying to, to get across. For there. sure. That's that is, I mean, there's, you know, and it's like people have talked about jerk bait and we're snagging them in the side of the face. I have not been able to throw over a fish and yank it into their side yet. If that was the case, I would have won a lot of times. <laughs> but those fish, like when you're jerking, that jerk bait's coming down through there, you can watch them. They'll like jump, they'll go over it, under it, slashing at it. It's never like, you know, I've I, I've tried, trust me, and I ain't been able to do it. Not know? in tournament and competition, they're, they're just a, just fun fishing, right? <laughs> yeah, just fun fishing, yeah. I mean, that's when I was learning. I was like, can you really do that? I mean, a few years ago when I was using ponds and stuff, I was like, can you really? Get, and I could never do it, but you'd be jerking it and those fish would, they'd come at it. And it's amazing how many fish miss your bait and never touch it. I mean, it is insane how many, and you're, and you'll be just twitching it and you'll stop it and they'll slash up at it and hell then, okay, they catch it inside their face. Well, they got nine opportunities to do that on, you know, yeah. a jerk bait, three hooks, you know? So, so I mean, it's. Somehow you guys are that's, really good at snagging them with just the back treble right in their mouth because that's the only one they oh, always have. And you're like, man, I did it again. Back hook right in his mouth. I backed yeah. it. I backed it right up yeah. to him. You know, like it's it's crazy. But yeah. Luke, a couple. I, I, I they probably told you on site a little bit, but a couple accolades that you know on Bassmaster Live while we're doing the show. I'm I'm looking at different trends. I pulled up this list from past years when Joey Sefuentes was winning at Seminole. I thought maybe we'd have a ten pound plus win there. But your 14-pound, three-ounce victory at Santee Cooper was the 13th time in Elite Series history. So since 06, I think that means that this is like the 
uh, 17th or 18th year of the Elite Series, we've had 13 different angler or 13 different instances of 10 plus pound victories. You make that now, adding that one to the list, and you're sixth all time. We've had Patrick Walter set the mark in the fall of 2020 with 29 pounds, 10 ounces. Koof Hall followed it up the next year at Gunnersville, winning by 17 14. Mike McClelland, who you just mentioned, 15 9 at Grand Lake in the inaugural Elite Season. Uh, Skeet Reese won by 14 and a half pounds at Smith Mountain. Chris Lane won by 14 and a quarter at St. John's, and you were 14 3 right behind him. That's a that's a crazy list to be on. Obviously, the blue trophy and 100 grand, those are things that you've dreamt about a long time. But I know as a fisherman, as a as a former basketball player, soccer player, like Kyle played baseball. You dream about the wins, but you also dream about just showing off when you get the chance to show off. And I wanna I wanna score on him disrespectfully. I, I wanna I wanna run up the score when we can. So when you get to those lists of things that haven't been done a lot, does that do you sit back later and you're like, man, that was a great week, but like it was like a his like this was like a an all time week. Like not many people have ever been in in this realm, and that's pretty cool to have that happen. It, it was, you know, and when I got back and I was looking at, and I'm I look, you know, I don't look back at tournaments too much. Um, you know, I, I'm going to I look at things I should have done better, you know, and stuff like that, or things could have been better. Um, you know, the first day I, I told you I lost a couple of big ones, five or seven or eight pounder. I'll really stick it to them, you know, or if I have uh, I did have one fish I hadn't retied in a while, just stupid on me. And I flipped up there and I hit her and did absolutely nothing with it. And I watched her swim back to the tree and shake her mouth and watch my bait fall out of her mouth. And she sat there and I never got her to bite again. And she was a seven plus. So you put those two on my bags, you know, I'm jumping up another six, eight, nine pounds probably. And uh, I could have, I could have got my century belt. I did want, I'd like to get one of those. Uh, I've had, you know, two or three opportunities to have it. And I just can't close the dang door. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I'll take the consolation of catching, getting a trophy. But yeah, no big deal. It could have been. Now it was it was like a nothing went wrong during the well. I say nothing went wrong. I had those two fish. I lost four fish. I never fished a day clean. I lost two on the final day. Uh, those ones on the first day, which I was just multiples, and then that one on day two. So I never fished a clean day the whole tournament. Well, I mean, uh, we were laughing the whole time I, on day four when you lost them. So you weren't you weren't in doubt. I mean, we were having fun. We're like, oh shucks, he didn't make it a twenty two pound lead at this point on Bass Track or anything like that. But you did. You had twenty one pounds and three ounces day one, twenty three nine on day two, then twenty six three on day three, twenty five fifteen on day four. Um, what was it like idling in? If you don't mind me asking, cameraman asks for an update. You're idling in. You all but thought you probably had won. You know, you had such a big bag. Uh, but you know it's Santee Cooper. Someone else can catch a giant bag as well. But, man, I never want to catch 12 pounds and back my way into a win and, and use up all my lead. I, I'd want to do what you did and just just slam the door. Did it feel good idling in and, and waving waving to Robert probably on the dock as you checked in or whoever was there? honestly I was that was the only time I started getting kind of wondering because you know now we have no idea and I felt like even after I caught my fifth fish that morning I felt like I needed one more fish all day long I needed one more fish and I'm just like you know I was I said Cobb all he's got to do is catch 28 29 pounds and that's so possible there you know it's not like you know, we're at, I don't know, Murray, you know, where everybody's got 20 and yeah. you got a yeah. you got a 15 pound lead and you catch 18 pounds like they're going to catch, you. you know, it's not like that. And, but, you know, as well as I do, Santee, someone, and the way things changed that final day, I said, Robertson, what he's done, you know, throwing a big bait, he could catch 28, 35, you know, that place has got him. I mean, it's five casts to have 40 pounds. And it can happen there. And that that bothered me a little bit. But when I pulled into, I actually came across a little bit early. I normally wouldn't have done that. 
but the lightning had Hunter. He was scared to death. I thought he was going to crawl in my rod box, but, uh, <laughs> It, it was it was ding and that lighting was pretty rough it Even was bad I'm like oh yeah when i'm backed into the trees and we're sitting down in the boat like this is not good you know i even got my power poles down in the water just because they're sticking up higher than us i don't want them to catch you know electricity but uh i came back and i seen Cobb in you know where we're coming out of i was like that's not good and i know he couldn't have caught him on a wacky worm after about 10 o'clock <laughs> because he would have thrown it and it would have like ended up the other end of the lake, you know. Uh, D spooled him. So, yeah, so I didn't know. I mean, I don't know. I wanted to know. I really wanted to know so I could have relaxed a little bit. And it, it never seemed real. It still really doesn't. I mean, I, it does until Aaron sends me a reel he's making up for when we drop the YouTube or something like that. Then it's like, okay that that happened and like, i did that that's me emotion. that's me yeah yeah so it, it was uh you know it's you don't i didn't expect to win that tournament even when everybody's like well i bet you're glad we're going i'm like I, i've done well at the lake but did i expect to win then no i really did um even with what i found in practice i was not thoroughly impressed with my practice i didn't have a very good practice and uh but when I caught that fish on day three of practice, I looked at Aaron and I said, we might have a shot. And he like got quiet. It was kind of one of the moments, you know, and I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. Then I ended up not even catching fish, catching them like that. So it was, but I said, I told him, I said, they're coming. He's like, what do you mean? I said, look how white this fish is like an eight pounder. And I said, they're coming. And I pulled around there on another deal and lost a four and a couple, caught a couple two pounders. I said, they're coming. And, uh, Sure enough, they showed up. <laughs> I mean, everything worked out. It was getting warmer. And uh, I think that was the final 10 trees that those fish were spawning on for the year. I, I got to even I got to even make a mention to the story there. You were talking about idling into uh, to back to take off right away in the last day. Uh, I got to remember on the last day, obviously, the weather was extremely bad. <laughs> so there was nobody out on the water. So at one point, Luke <laughs> turns around and he goes, like, you know, you can tell what he's asking, but like, yeah, obviously I can't tell him anything, but he goes, <laughs> he goes, why are there no boats on the water? Like, why is there nobody out here? Like thinking like there should be more people following <laughs> me. Like follow. as well as it's going. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, dude, I know what you're asking. There's nobody out here. He's like there's nobody <laughs> out here. It's about to blow a hundred miles an hour. And there's going to be a tornado in like two hours. There's no boats out here to, <laughs> to follow. You. But, uh, but Luke, I, I wanted to ask, you know, obviously it's been a little while since the win happened. You finally made it back to Oklahoma. Um, you know, we figured you might have enough money to buy a new stereo compared to the old one behind you there over your right <laughs> shoulder. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> since getting, since getting home, like, I just want to know, like, what's the coolest moment? Like, was it finally getting to go home and see all your family and your friends? Like, what was the one moment that like it finally, like, I don't know if it's set in or just the coolest moment so far, uh, you know, since, since, you know, getting this win. Well, I got depressed before I got to come home because we went to lay Lake and I got my <laughs> teeth kicked in. So I went from kicked in to like getting them kicked plumb down my throat, but no, I was ready to come home. Man. Like I've said, a lot of people, I think it was six weeks. I hadn't seen a family member hadn't, you know, I've talked to him on the phone. Uh, and I I received multiple phone calls, emails, Facebook, my Instagram. Like that was awesome. That was that was awesome. Uh, but when I finally got home, which I didn't get to come home because Dustin made me go film for two days as soon as I got home for with <laughs> Yom and Boo. So I didn't get to really do a lot then. But uh, I think it was a uh, Thursday or Friday. I guess Friday. Uh, finally got to see my family all of them like it wasn't just you know i come home and my we have a boat barn down with my dad so i got to take the boat down there and obviously talk to my mom and dad that night um but i didn't get to see anybody till which i came back to work thursday and friday so i got to see plenty of people from colgate but um friday all, seven, night, all we, 17 of them yeah yeah and uh we went to my went out to my sister's house and we had like a little They'll get together, brought the trophy out, and went swimming with my niece because she's been asking me to go swimming since I've been gone. And uh, that was when it really set in, though. I mean, like, some of my really close friends were there, 
and uh you know just got to sit around and eat hamburgers and chill out you know i hadn't i never got to do that you know me and aaron got to do it obviously at folly beach but uh we chilled out too much and i didn't come back and decide to fish that next week <laughs> but it was it was uh it was good i mean i mean you know a lot of guys get to you know have people travel with them it's their wives or kids you know that's that's awesome but you know when you actually get blood relatives right there beside you it's just different you know El Kyle and Mandy and all them got me a cake and pictures and stuff like that and that was that might have been when it really set in because it's like he made this you know <laughs> Kyle produced the same photo just a year in advance from me last year and uh that was special too I mean when you got people around you that you know might not be blood or whatever but they legit care about you doing well you know i think kyle and mandy wanted me to win more than i did you know and aaron also i mean they were more hell mandy called crying i think you know she was so happy so you know even you got popping help. bottles in the office on camera whatever just do it <laughs> you know i mean hell even aaron we watched all right you know we didn't done, done our closing on the youtube driving out and which all of our buddies showed up from south carolina too which that was that was that, that was special cool. also when we were driving out you know he's like hey i need to get a closing i'm like well this is gonna be tough you know and it's like both of us over here bawling our dang eyes out like we're two 12 year old girls you know but those are the moments that you remember you know holding that trophy up was one thing little aaron holding the trophy up that was probably the funniest thing i've ever seen <laughs> when he like gosh dang this thing's freaking heavy like putting it up but you know the the people you see and those special moments that you know you get to be around them really makes it everything you know i've met some when we were there last year uh there's this group of kids kyle can probably remember this there's a group of kids i pulled up beside polonic and uh these kids going ooh and on over polonic which i kind of was too because you know he's catching them <laughs> Brando, what do you got? And he's like, I think I got 27 or 28. I said, man, that's awesome. And these kids were there watching us. They were young. What were they, like three, four, five years old? Yeah, and yeah. I said, hey, come here. They're like, what? I said, get up here in the boat where you can go over and see what Brandon's got. And uh, their parents were like, are you sure? I was like, get them up in here. Come on. Like, like the worst thing they could do is probably to my boat is probably the least amount of things that I could have done to the boat. <laughs> and they crawled up in there and they would that like made them ecstatic. And then Kyle walks back and he's got two bags for me. And he's like, those kids are like, why do you got two bags? I'm like, well, you're about to find out. And I pulled all those fish out and <laughs> helped me. Back. But, you know, I had 33. 27. Well, that's that day, that's I, it, Brandon. I, that's all you got. That's all you got. Yeah. Cool story, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Watch me, watch me go. <laughs> but uh, after I, after I weighed in, I drove around there to load up. Every one of those kids and their parents were there. And I talked to them probably for an hour. And those kids were like, they wouldn't let us leave until we got to say thank you. And, you know, I signed some stuff for them. Those same kids were at that final wait, right beside the boat and stuff when I was going in. So that, you know, maybe I left a little bit of an impression on them to do good for somebody. But that was, that was cool. Well, the coolest Very thing good. there is that they left an impression on you. So it, as long as an impression was left by one of the, the the groups, that's when you know a memory was made. Um, Luke, we we got to come to your town and shoot some features with you uh, for Phoenix Pro Diaries that that have aired and your your lifestyle as a hardware store owner operator, things like that. And you're come up through the opens. I remember covering you, and and the only logo on the side of your boat was Horizon. You know, back in the day, and and you're like how do you remember me? And I was like, well, I remember everybody, you know, like, so of course I remember you. And then I hear the stories about, you know, the ABA national championship you win or the race, the race Scott national championship you win to propel you into the elites financially. You have been since, since 2019, when you started, uh, you have been one of the most rock solid, consistent anglers like Brock Mosley, like some of the other folks that we've had on the podcast recently. Uh, getting that breakthrough i mean we have that short list bill lowen's on there and then he takes his name off of there brock's on there and he's gotten five seconds and he's so close you were on there uh, i know that you're not having the best season that you want to have but going from consistent 
to then when you get your shot and your shot on goal is a top 10 to be able to win and executing on that Kyle and I were talking about, that's hard to do. Um, is there anything that you can tell to the, to the fans or people who are haven't gotten their win yet, haven't gotten a breakthrough that they think they should have, but just to keep plugging and doing what you know is right. Cause it'll, it'll come uh, it, whether it's five years or 10 years or two years. Yeah. No, and I think with my consistency this year, as it's not been consistently at the front, I did change up this year. I did. I was tired of being that. Okay. Hackney told me a long time ago, if you cut checks, you stay on the leads. He was right. 100%. Because if you cut checks, you're going to make the classic. And this last year, everybody's like, you've been, you've been so consistent. And I, I really pride myself on that. But I also, in my mind, I was like, consistency is not a trophy, <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah, it can get you a long ways and keep you there. But I am, when am I going to get that killer instinct type deal? Like, I'm fishing to win all these dang things. And it took me a long time for that to happen when I was growing up fishing. Because I was fishing to cast a check just to do it. I wanted to, you know, I just want to do well. If I get me a couple top tens a year, that's great. And all my top 10, it seems like I fell on my face. You know, I run out of fish or something like that. And this year, my mindset was a little bit different. I'm going to be hard-headed. I'm going to be a Christie, you know, that I'm going to go lock this in my hand. You know, and I've done that these tournaments this year. Brian Schmidt, uh, Greg Hackney. Yeah, I'm I'm going to do that. Because they didn't get to that level by fishing scared, you know. And I, that happened at Lake Lake. I was like, well, I just want to get out of this thing. I was ready to get out of that and go home, honestly. I tell you right now. I mean, I had some fish leading me astray on day three of practice. Uh, but I was just not – I could not get anything going. Uh, but I went out and drop shot it on spots for two days, or a lot of it. You know, just trying to catch a limit. I just need to get a limit, so I'll be okay. Well, that trying to get a limit got me – dead last almost so that's out the window on my you know? fantasy team appreciate it thank you thank you appreciate it yeah <laughs> so high i was like i was telling people i said late late must be a good place for me because ronnie's got me picked dead to the right to do well here and boy i done dead to the right the other oh, i know i picked it preseason though <laughs> i i just was like you know i think i think santee's gonna be solid but i think that lay could be a breakthrough one well i just missed time to buy about two weeks but uh, that that is interesting. The consistent thing. Bill Lowen goes and is so consistent, and gets the nickname, then finally wins one and loses his consistency for a year or two, and he's got to refine how he old Bill Lowen so he can make classics again because he doesn't want to be in the expo anymore. So that balance. And Brian Schmidt says, "Man, I I'm okay with living on the classic cut line if it means I have a shot to win every year because I normally win one to save myself." And so uh, he doesn't want to risk his winning uh, intuition for consistency. So. Luke, man, appreciate you joining us. Kyle, are you are you good with your bro, Luke, uh, on this episode of the podcast? I think we're we're squared away. We'll let Luke head to the Best Buy and snag him a new speaker. <laughs> no, exactly. <I> back. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, congratulations! The fourth stop of the Elite Series season, taking home your first Elite title, much deserved. I know it was hard earned, and. Uh, Good luck at the Sabine River in a, in a week or two, and we will see you there, obviously, and hopefully we'll have you on Bassmaster Live again. All right. Sounds good, buddy. We'll see you all later. Awesome. Kyle, Luke Palmer, Bassmaster Elite Series champion. We've had three first-time winners on the Elite Series this year in our five events. Or I guess, sorry, it was three at that point. We have four first-time winners, counting Will Davis at Lay Lake, which he'll be in the next episode of Winning Ways with the Sabine River champion as well. So what a, uh awesome win for Luke. I know it was career-changing, career-making. When you kind of have the, the look of a pro uh, physically, you've got the performance of a consistent pro. You just need that, you just need that notable, that notable fourth quarter, that notable moment. You know, they say that about every NBA MVP. There's a certain point in the season where they have that game against a high-level opponent or a high-level individual person they're matched up with, and they they do it and knock it out of the park. That's their MVP moment. For him, he's been so close, and that was his uh, career moment so far to get that win. And 
to do it in dramatic to do it in uh overwhelming fashion yeah no question and you know i think the one thing that will be interesting to see obviously we've only got one tournament since his uh his win is you know how that affects the rest of his career because you know like he mentioned there you know we've seen other guys in the past have the same kind of thing happen you finally get a win and then you start you know piecing a couple together every every year or so um it'll be interesting to see with luke now that he's kind of got you know like he mentioned that killer edge that killer instinct um you know knowing how to win now as an elite and having had so many opportunities before uh it'll be interesting to see how he handles that moving forward i think that he'll have plenty of more opportunities um and you know one thing that we talked about before the um santee tournament was the fact that in his entire career he's never finished in elite series competition worse than 50th two tournaments in a row so Hopefully uh, we'll we'll see him keep that streak alive. And Savini's definitely on the uh, hook for that streak to be broken. But uh, you know, has been so so consistent. I'd say like of all guys in the elite series, one of the more um, quietly consistent guys. You know, you just kind of you know some people overlook him maybe just because he hasn't had that win. Uh, but he's so consistently in the check range in the top fifty that um, you know it is definitely special to see him get his first win it'll be interesting to see how that uh you know fuels him the rest of the way yeah i think i looked at it i don't want to be wrong i could pull it up real quick if we do it to end the podcast out but i believe in luke palmer's four previous seasons on the elite series he has never finished outside the the, the 20 to to 30 range he's been in the 20s in angler of the year every single year yeah 26 20th 29th and then last year uh 28th so Four years on the elites, four years in the 20s for Angler of the Year. Now, he might not be – where is he at in points this year? Let's 40, see mid-40. So, halfway mid through the year, he's right, you know, just above that mark. Um, right now, he's unofficially five points out of the classic cut. So, the sky is not falling for Luke Palmer. Life is good. Big, big win. Half the season left. Uh, we'll see if he keeps that streak alive of never going worse than 50th in two events in a row. Sabine up next. For episode 128 of the Inside Bassmaster podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, I'm Ronnie Moore. That's Kyle Jesse. We're signing off for the Winning Ways episode for Stop 3 and Stop 4 of the Elite Series season at Lake Murray and Santee Cooper. Drew Benton, Luke Palmer, your champions. Drew's second title for the Bassmaster Elite Series. Luke breaking through for his first win. Congratulations to those guys, and we will see you in the next episode, which will be our Sabine River Bassmaster Elite Series preview. It's coming up quick. We'll only have three events left in the season after the Sabine, so you won't want to miss that there. Make sure you set your fantasy lineups ahead of time. But we will be giving you our picks and a little bit of a preview in the next episode. So we will see you then.